Yes, so good morning. Uh, my name is Markus Banage. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this um, summer school on stratified spaces, where we will focus on topological and analytic aspects of such spaces. There are other aspects uh, as well, of course. Um, and we'll see some of them to some extent. For example, algebraic geometry will always be in the background uh, uh, to some extent. Uh, certainly, at least because it is a source of many interesting examples. Uh, now, um, people here have very different backgrounds, I think. Some of you are algebraic topologists, some of you are physicists, some, I believe, are algebraic geometers, and some are analysts or differential geometers. So therefore, um, Jochen and I, I think, have made a great effort to find the, the common denominator for, for all of us and to base the lectures uh, on, uh, on, on what we hope is sort of common ground for, for all of us. And as Jochen already said in his introductory remarks, uh, this, of course, um, makes certain choices necessary. Uh, we cannot give complete proofs of all theorems and, and, and so on, but we hope to bring uh, across uh, a certain, certain key points in the topological and uh, analytic study of, of stratified spaces. Uh, so, <clears throat> why are stratified spaces uh, so important? Well, uh, as you know, a great deal of effort in the 20th century has been devoted to manifolds. Manifolds, as you all know, are spaces that are uh, very uniform. Uh, every neighborhood uh, looks the same locally. So locally manifolds look like uh, Euclidean spaces, but not globally so. Um, and this uniformity has a lot of consequences. And <clears throat> the theory of manifolds is by now highly developed um, uh, in high dimensions, largely due to surgery theory. And the invariants that play a role uh, <clears throat> in surgery theory or in classification schemes of manifolds are invariants such as the signature, for example, uh, which is the fundamental Bordism invariant, but then also lots of characteristic classes, characteristic numbers, and so on. Because, for example, characteristic classes in general provide a way to find invariants of smooth manifolds that are not homotopy invariants, but are topological invariants, and, um, or at least smooth invariants, as the case may be, depending on which classes exactly you, you look at. Um, <clears throat> now, for example, if we take the signature, the definition of the signature rests on Poincaré duality. So that you can see uh, the cornerstone of many of the invariants that have been discovered in the 20th century for manifolds is really a certain symmetry in the cohomology of manifolds called Poincaré duality. And Poincaré duality is what fails for singular spaces as we shall shortly see. Uh, therefore, our main concern from the topological side will be to find ways to restore Poincaré duality even in the presence of uh, singularities. And this is what intersection homology is about. So I will give an introduction to intersection homology. Um, I will uh, say a few words about Cheeger's work on L2 cohomology and the relation between the two theories. I will probably, if time permits, also give an outlook uh, concerning a third approach which exists now to defining Poincaré duality uh, on uh, singular spaces, which is not isomorphic to intersection homology nor to Chigas L2 cohomology. Uh, and uh, based on this, we will then go forward and um, discuss some of the invariants that I alluded to earlier, such as the signature and certain characteristic classes, um, the L classes. Uh, so this will, uh, this will be then uh, our topic towards the end of the week. 
Okay, are there any questions so far uh, that you would like to ask about the general structure of, of the lecture series? So that was sort of a brief outlook. Okay, well, uh, if there are no questions, then uh, let's, let's get started. Let me remind everybody uh, about Poincaré duality for manifolds. So uh, let MN be a closed oriented manifold. of dimension n. So the n here will always denote the dimension. <clears throat> now Poincaré duality, I will often abbreviate as PD, can be phrased in modern language as the following statement. Let's consider the n minus ith integral cohomology group uh, of the manifold and the ith homology group. Then Poincaré duality says that there is an isomorphism between these two groups. <coughs> so um, what is the map? So recall that in algebraic topology uh, there is a product called the cap product. So, um, this is a product from the jth cohomology uh, and the nth homology. to the n minus jth uh, homology. And uh, if the manifold, so closed means compact and no boundary. So if it's closed and oriented, then there is a distinguished class in the nth homology called the fundamental class, which I will write like this. And then if you take the product of a cohomology class, this cap product uh, of a cohomology class with the fundamental class, that's the map that gives you the isomorphism. Now, there are various other ways uh, in which to uh, rephrase this. Uh, some of these ways forget more information uh, than this. This is sort of the most powerful statement that one can make. But for example, you could imagine that you, you're only interested in cohomology with real coefficients. Now then you could use the universal coefficient theorem to rewrite the left-hand side here as a HOM group, HOM H n minus I m, now with real coefficients into the reals, is then isomorphic to the ith real homology of m. But phrased like this, it's clear that this is equivalent in turn to a non-degenerate bilinear form. So, so this is equivalent to saying that there is a non-degenerate uh, pairing between the n minus ith real homology of m and the ith real homology of m into R. Now, if we phrase it in this, in this language, then this has a very nice geometric interpretation. Namely, so geometrically, elements in homology are represented by cycles, right? So you take an n minus i cycle in M, then you take an i-dimensional cycle in M, and what you can do, and this already is Lefschetz's uh, theory of the intersection product, is you can move one cycle to be transverse to the other one. This can always be done by, by a small movement. And once they are transverse to each other, you can intersect them 
and you use the orientation to assign a, si a sign plus or minus one to each intersection point and then you sum these up with signs uh, and this gives you the value of the intersection pairing. And so that's a nice geometric interpretation of what this is. So this, this here is the intersection form as it is sometimes called. Uh, if you are coming more from the Ram cohomology, on the other hand, then you could envision the intersection form uh, as being, being a form given as follows. So here now I'm using um, the Ram cohomology. Here you could simply say you take two forms you two uh, classes represented by closed forms, say omega and eta, and uh, since their wedge product is a form of degree n, you can integrate this over the compact manifold and get a number, and this corresponds to the intersection form uh, that we had down here. So these are all different viewpoints of the same thing, and this form then is non-degenerate, right, would be, would be the theorem. Uh, Okay, <clears throat> now this has, uh, as I indicated in my introduction, a number of uh, key applications. Say <clears throat> that the dimension is divisible by, by four. Then you could look in particular at the middle dimension and would get a quadratic form on the middle group because then n minus i uh, is also 2k And then this form is in fact moreover symmetric. So you have a non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form and you know from linear algebra that this can always be diagonalized. So you put it in diagonal form, then there will not be any zeros on the diagonal, only positive eigenvalues and negative ones. And you count the number of positive entries on the diagonal and subtract from it the number of negative entries on the diagonal and this gives you what's called the signature of this quadratic form and therefore you obtain what's called the signature of a manifold. So this form has a signature which I'll write as sigma of m, an integer. And the importance uh, of that signature stems from the fact, which is due to Tom, uh, if m is the boundary of a compact n plus one manifold, a compact manifold, oriented also, I, I won't say it anymore. In principle, everything now will be oriented in my talk. Uh, I won't stress it anymore. Uh, <clears throat> then the signature of M vanishes. And so in particular, if two manifolds are bordered to each other, uh, then their signatures are equal. And so one says that the signature is a bordism invariant. <clears throat> and, uh, in higher dimensional classification schemes for manifolds such as surgery theory, the signature plays a key uh, uh, role as a surgery obstruction because under a surgery, the input and output of a surgery are always related by, by bordism. Therefore, it follows you can never change the signature by doing surgery. So it is a fundamental obstruction at a certain point in surgery theory. And that makes the signature very important, in, in, especially in high dimensional manifold theory. But uh, we can go further. 
Um, let me just say a word about the work of Hirzebruch. Hirzebruch considered um, uh, L, so called L polynomials. Uh, and so if we assume that M is smooth, so that we have a tangent bundle, then we can speak of the Pontryagin classes. Pi of the tangent bundle. So uh, these are classes in the uh, four ith cohomology, integral cohomology uh, of the manifold. Uh, and here to prove considered certain polynomials in these Pontryagin classes. So there is, for example, a polynomial L1, which just depends on P1. And so it happens to be a third of P1. So this is still fairly simple. And this was certainly known before Hirzebruch. I mean, uh, certainly Tom, Tom knew this. And um, the second one, depends then on the first two Pontryagin classes. It's written L2. And um, it's 1 over 45, 7 P2 minus P1 squared. So um, I'll write dots, right? So there's an L3, P1, P2, P3, and so on. But it's in fact not so clear, perhaps, how to really continue this, because certainly the building principle for these polynomials is not at all apparent from what I've written down, right? So, um, <clears throat> but in any case, uh, his um, famous signature theorem is the following. If you now uh, take again the case n equals 4k and you take, so I'll just briefly write lk of tm, meaning I plug in the Pontryagin classes as we discussed. Um, then this is a top cohomology class, so I can evaluate it on the, on the manifold. Uh, and then you get the signature. So this is a remarkable identity because these polynomials, uh, for, for one thing, these polynomials are only defined over, let's say, Q, over the rationals. So you have some expression here like this and you integrate it, but on the right-hand side, uh, the signature is always an integer. So already you get lots of highly non-trivial uh, divisibility conditions uh, that have to be satisfied here for such an equation to hold. So that's, that's extremely non-obvious and, and, and highly non-trivial. Furthermore, a, a second consequence of this formula is that since the right-hand uh, side is clearly a homotopy invariant, being defined entirely in cohomological terms, uh, the cohomology ring being a homotopy uh, invariant, the left-hand side is therefore a homotopy invariant also, but again, this is extremely non-apparent from the definition of the L classes since the tangent bundle itself certainly is not a homotopy invariant of a, mani of a smooth manifold, right? Um, and in fact, one can show that only the top L class is a homotopy invariant and all the others are not. So th therefore, the L classes are highly non-trivial invariants of manifolds. They are so subtle that they can actually distinguish two manifolds within the same homotopy type, which can never be done, of course, by looking at cohomology or homotopy groups, et cetera, et cetera, structures like these. So that's why the L classes are so important and um, we would like to have them for singular spaces as well. Uh, and, 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 and part of the program will be ultimately to see how one can get this for singular spaces. Okay. So all of this is sort of a consequence of Poincaré duality. Now let's go to singular spaces. 
let's move from manifolds to singular spaces. And I want to start off with an example to see concretely what can happen. Okay, so we, we look at, an, at, at a concrete example, a three-dimensional space, <coughs> the suspension of a two torus. So, I mean, I can, this cannot be literally drawn on the board, but uh, to aid our understanding, we might make the following picture, for instance. I could envision the torus as being a square with identifications as usual. You identify opposite sides like this. And then you suspend it. So this could be drawn something like this. <clears throat> so let me call the two suspension points x plus and x minus. Um, and let me write x0 for the set consisting of these two points. So certainly this is a manifold. But also notice that if I remove these points, the rest is also a manifold because then the space is just an open interval across the two torus, which is a nice smooth manifold, right? So this is, this is homeomorphic to some open interval across T2, also a manifold. Um, so while this space can be decomposed into manifolds, in a fairly natural way. It is, however, globally not a manifold. <coughs> however, X itself is not a manifold because a neighborhood, say, of a neighborhood of X plus in X looks like an open cone on the two torus. So I'll write the open cone like this. But the open cone is certainly not homeomorphic to an open three ball, because if it were, then the cone point would have to go to some interior point of this ball but then you could remove both and have a homeomorphism of the outsides. But that would mean that S2 cross an interval should be homeomorphic to T2 cross an interval. But that cannot be the case, for example, by looking at the fundamental group. Therefore, this is not a manifold, although it can be in a natural way decomposed into manifolds. <clears throat> okay, what about Invariance. So let's look now, so we, as I said, we are particularly interested in Poincaré duality. So let's, let's make a homology calculation here. Uh, um, you know from algebraic topology, there is a suspension isomorphism for computing the homology of a suspension. So if we compute the first reduced homology, so this is reduced homology, of X3, then this is by the suspension theorem, suspension isomorphism H0 reduced uh, of X3. And since this is connected, this is just zero. Uh, now what about H2 of X? This is H1 reduced uh, of, um, of uh, T2, of course, of the thing that I suspended. And so uh, H1 of T2, well, this is of course Z plus Z generated by longitude and meridian. And you can see nicely in the picture. I mean, in the picture, you see here the longitude and the meridian in the two torus. And if you suspend them, uh, for example, if you suspend this, this circle, this is of course a circle because these are identified, uh, then uh, this is homeomorphic to a two sphere. So that's a two cycle sitting in the space 
and it's one of these generators in H2, right? The suspension, and similarly, the suspension of the other is the second generator. <coughs> so um, let me write B for the Betti numbers, the homology ranks of a space. So there's B0, there's B1, there's B2, and there's B3, because it's a three-dimensional space of X. So we've computed these numbers now. This is, of course, 1 and 1. But uh, <coughs> B1 is 0 and B2 is 2. Now, we clearly see that Poincaré duality fails, right? What I've written here, this kind of symmetry, uh, already looking at the ranks, is violated. So we have a big problem, right? Now we face a big problem because I've just explained how wonderful it is to have Poincaré duality, how wonderful the signature is, how great the L classes are, and so forth. And already at the very beginning, when we allow singularities, we face a fundamental problem, namely a complete failure of Poincaré duality. So Poincaré duality fails. These should be equal. Uh, so, uh, as I said, there are sort of three approaches to restoring Poincaré duality on singular spaces. <coughs> there is an approach called intersection homology. IH, which is due to Goreski and McPherson. Uh, and independently of uh, the discovery of Goreski and McPherson, uh, uh, Jeff Cheeger discovered that when you look at L2 cohomology, uh, so we'll hear more about this, of course, later. Uh, with an appropriate conical metric near the singularities, uh, then you also get Poincaré duality again for L2 cohomology. So, so this, there, this was independently discovered by Jeff Cheeger, Cheeger's L2 cohomology. But um, with Cheeger's metric, uh, these two will be seen to be dual to each other. Which was observed later, after both of these uh, <coughs> results were there, it was then later observed that in fact they are dual to each other. And then there is a third approach via intersection spaces which uses homotopy theory to lift such techniques to the space level to solve certain problems that are connected with these theories. So we'll discuss this a little bit. All right, good. So it's perhaps time then to give a formal definition of what a, at least a topological stratified space is. So let me do this first, and then we'll run through some examples. You've already seen one example, but let's do, uh, after the definition, let's do a couple more examples to, to become more familiar with that definition. <coughs> so, the following definition will be inductive on dimension. So, this is, if you will, a warning. Um, the definition is, is to be understood in an inductive manner on the dimension of spaces. So I start with, uh, with dimension zero. And I say um, a topologically stratified uh, space
of dimension zero is a countable set <coughs> with a discrete topology. Okay, so that's simple. Uh, but now, um, a topologically stratified space of dimension n is a paracompact Hausdorff space. So this is similar to manifolds where you also always assume paracompactness and Hausdorff, right? I mean, uh, a paracompact Hausdorff space Uh, X together with a filtration which will later be called the stratification of the space but not any filtration is a stratification. There are conditions that this, uh, this filtration has to satisfy in order to be eligible to be called a stratification. So together with the filtration by closed subsets, so it's convenient to put x, xn equal to x, and then there are closed subsets xn minus one, containing xn minus two, and so forth up to x0. It's also sometimes convenient to let x negative 1 uh, be the empty set uh, for formal reasons such that. Okay, so now uh, there will be two conditions that this filtration should satisfy. Firstly, <coughs> the differences between these should be manifolds. And this is suggested by our example. We've seen that there is sort of a, right, so there would be an x3 and then there's this x0. The differences are manifolds. And so we, we make this part of our definition. We want, to we want to be able to decompose a singular space at least into pieces that are manifolds. So we say um, xi minus xi minus one is a topological manifold of dimension i for all i. <coughs> and uh, secondly, we ask, however, a condition about how these manifolds come together to form the entire space. There's something one should say about how the topology relates between these manifolds that the space is now decomposed into. So we call this local normal triviality. And we require the following. Uh, <coughs> for every point x in such a, I mean every point lies in some such difference, say it lies in xi minus xi minus one, for every such point, uh, there exists an open neighborhood uh, ux in x um, and a homeomorphism phi from ux to the following model type space. So <coughs> you see this x lies in this i-dimensional manifold. So locally along that manifold it has clearly a neighborhood that looks like a Euclidean space of dimension i. So I write ri. But there will be another piece which is responsible for the singularity, and that should look like a cone. It should look like an open cone on some L 
right? where <coughs> is a compact topologically stratified space of dimension n minus i minus 1. So you see then the cone on it has dimension n minus i and if you cross with i then the whole thing has dimension n which is the dimension of that set this set being open in Xn, which is of dimension n. Of dimension n minus i minus 1. And <coughs> so important is the compactness. This will ensure that such spaces are always what's called locally compact in topology, and that's kind of important for many constructions. We don't want to look at spaces that are not locally compact, okay? So, um, Compactness is important and also notice now the inductive nature as I, as I announced of this definition because uh, the definition is not circular although in the definition the term topologically stratified space does occur. Uh, it is however of strictly smaller dimension than n therefore inductively I have a well-defined notion. Right? Uh, also notice that uh, L being a topologically stratified space, it comes equipped by definition with its own filtration like this uh, by closed subsets, but that leads in a natural manner to a stratification of the cone. And then if you cross with Ri, you just cross the strata here with Ri so that this is stratified, but so is this by intersecting ux with the strata in x. And then we ask that this homeomorphism should be stratum preserving. Okay, so I'll note here this should be stratum preserving. So that is the definition of a, of a topologically stratified space. Now let me give a couple of examples so that we see uh, some, some key, I mean this uh, may look somewhat artificial perhaps at first if you've never seen this before. But I want to give a whole list of examples so that you begin to see that this definition is in fact very natural and occurs in lots of situations. I mean the, the truth is, is that many spaces that occur in nature actually are not manifolds, but have singularities, right? I mean, if you take some algebraic variety, right, uh, it will in general have singularities, of course. Uh, if you take some group action, some non-free group action, I mean, the orbit space is rarely a manifold, in fact. Or if you start with a non-compact manifold, and wish to apply some theorems that only apply to compact spaces, you could try to compactify your non-compact non manifold, but by doing so you usually, although you end up with a compact space, the cost that you have to pay for this is that you will end up with a singular space and so on. So these are just some uh, example classes where, where singularities arise. So this is an attempt to systematize the topology that is in common to all these examples. Right? Okay, so let's, so let's do some examples. Well, uh, we've already seen one. That was our suspension of T2. Where, as we have said, you set x0 to be x plus minus, and then uh, this L, by the way, is called a link. And L here for this X plus is just the two torus, evidently, right? So I hope everybody sees that. 
the link in this example, uh, question. Um, in the definition, you do not assume anything about the top stratum. No, I do not. I do not yet define a topologically stratified pseudo-manifold. I define only a topologically stratified space. Uh, and we'll talk about pseudo-manifolds later. I don't need pseudo-manifolds right now because the pseudo-manifold condition is only important once we talk about actual Poincaré duality and, and intersection homology. So I want to separate out the pseudo-manifold condition just from what a stratified space is. <coughs> okay. Um, one has to be, by the way, a little bit careful about the link. Let me just make the remark that the link in these topologically stratified spaces is not uniquely defined. You cannot speak of the link at a point to a stratum because there are examples. I mean, for example, uh, uh, Milner, in connection with the Hauptvermutung in topology, has produced uh, situations where you have two non-homeomorphic links whose cones, however, are homeomorphic. So the link is not uniquely determined by, by the space and the point and the stratification. So that's kind of a subtle point, um, but it's, um, uh, I think this was, this was um, observed by Siebenmann. However, an important class, as we shall see in a moment, of stratified spaces are piecewise linear spaces, or PL spaces for short. And there, the link is always well defined. The link in a PL space is at least always well defined. So in that sense, PL spaces are much simpler than topologically stratified spaces. Okay. Um, now, if you want a more interesting stratum, you could simply do the following. You could just take the previous example and cross it and cross it with a circle and then you could form you would have uh, x4 containing x1 and x1 would be um, s1 cross x plus minus but notice that the link doesn't change. The link is still the same as it was before. It is still the two torus, right? Because the Euclidean directions are so, sort of, they are all taken outside of this cone. Uh, so, the, so here, the link is still T2. And the I here would be one, right? There's an R1 direction coming from the circle direction. Okay, now. The definition is partly motivated, in fact, by what happens in PL topology. So let us discuss piecewise linear spaces. So my third uh, class of examples are PL spaces. <coughs> so PL again stands for piecewise linear. So let me recall what this is. Um, a PL space is a topological space X uh, equipped with a class T uh, <coughs> of locally finite um, simplicial triangulations uh, T <coughs> such that two conditions are satisfied. One, This class, <coughs> script T, is closed under subdivision, linear subdivision. It's closed under linear subdivision. 
Right? I mean, if you have a triangulation, you can always subdivide it by inserting new points and so on. For example, you can form the first barycentric subdivision, and, uh, et cetera. And these subdivided triangulations should also be in the class T. Uh, and secondly, <coughs> um, any two triangulations say T and T prime in this class have a common subdivision uh, in this class. You can always find, given two triangulations in the class, you can always find a common subdivision that's also in the class. Such a such a space equipped with such a structure is called a PL space in, in, in mathematics. <coughs> so for example, I will, uh, later on when I define intersection homology tomorrow, uh, I will um, do this first very geometrically using PL spaces and PL chains as my chain model. And later on, we will give a different description of intersection homology, a more advanced one, uh, using uh, sheaf theory and so on. So, but I won't assume any sheaf theory. So, uh, <clears throat> now, um, suppose you have such a triangulation, right? So that you have a simplicial complex K whose geometric realization is homeomorphic to the given space X, uh, you can do the following thing. You um, define the stratification, so this filtration here, these Xi, um, by the skeleton of K or more precisely their images under this homeomorphism, right? But I'll, I'll stop saying that actually. Uh, so uh, by, by using the skeleton, um, or let me say more precisely, define Xi to be the uh, I skeleton of, um, of K, essentially, uh, under this homeomorphism. <clears throat> and what we will, and so now let's check whether these two conditions hold. Is this now a topologically stratified space or not? Well, we have to check these two conditions. Condition number one uh, should be that the differences are topological manifolds, but this is kind of evident because uh, what is the difference after all? It's a disjoint union uh, of open I simplices. Open I simplices in the triangulation. And that's clearly, clearly an I dimensional manifold. So that works. Now, what about the second condition? So, so therefore, one is satisfied. Now, what about the local normal triviality, condition number two? <clears throat> well, um, let T prime be the first barycentric subdivision of T. or of K, um, and um, so let me make a picture. This is first, uh, this is best explained, I think, by, by actually drawing a picture. So suppose this is a piece of the triangulation. <clears throat> this is the original tr uh, complex K. And so you form the first barycentric subdivision. So you subdivide all the edges. And you subdivide and you put in barycenters for the 
two simplices and so on and then you put in new edges like this and so forth. Um, so now every simplex uh, delta in K has a so-called dual block in, in the subdivision K prime. Let me write the dual block as D of uh, the simplex delta. So what is the dual block? Uh, <coughs> well, you, if, if this, for example, were delta, this point here, then you look at all the simplices of the subdivision that contain this simplex, um, that contain this simplex. So for instance, here you find that you, have, that you have this simplex here, you have this one here, this one, this one, and so forth. So in fact, you have this region and the dual block of this delta would be this region shaded in orange. And then you can obtain other dual blocks by intersecting these top dimensional dual blocks. So for example, if, if this one simplex in the picture were your delta, uh, you could take the two endpoints, the two dual blocks of the endpoints and intersect them and what you would get is this. And so this red line would be the dual block of the red delta and so forth. So this already goes back to Poincaré and this is in fact how Poincaré proved his duality, his Poincaré duality. He assigned to a simplex the dual block and, and, and that's basically it. And the, the, and the reason why this induces an isomorphism is that the dual block, if the underlying space is a manifold, the dual block is again a cell, it's a ball. And therefore it computes cohomology correctly. Whereas if you were in a sing singular space, say you could also triangulate it, then you could still form the dual blocks, but you don't get it. I mean, since we've seen that Poincaré duality fails, something must go wrong in Poincaré's original proof. And what goes wrong is this, the dual block of a simplex in a singular space need not be a cell anymore. It will be a cone on something, but that something is not a sphere. So it will not be a ball, but the cone on something else. And this is where the proof breaks down because you can't use arbitrary contractible sets to, use com to compute cohomology. And that's where, where the proof would break down. And uh, well, to finish the verification of condition two, you can now say um, <coughs> you can take the neighborhood uh, of a point here, say here's the point X now, um, we want to show that it has such a neighborhood. By the way, these neighborhoods, if they have this kind of structure, they are sometimes called distinguished neighborhoods. We will sometimes speak of distinguished neighborhoods. So what is a distinguished neighborhood here? Well, we can just take the open simplex in which this x lies, uh, x lies right, in a unique open simplex. And so that gives you the Euclidean direction, right? Because an open simplex looks like, a, looks like some Ri. Cross, and then you take the dual block of this delta, maybe I'll write it as, I'll call it delta x to indicate that it's, it's the open simplex that contains x. Uh, so you take the dual block of this, as I explained, and you take the boundary of it, and that would be your L. And uh, if you then take the cone on it, 
Well, if you take the closed cone, you get the dual block back. But written like this, you, you get the structure that you want. And so, in fact, one could view it, one could view this definition as sort of abstracting topologically uh, uh, the, the, the kind of situation that always happens for a PL space. Right? So you can view this as a motivation for the definition that's on, on, the, on the board here. Now let me talk a bit about algebraic varieties. M. <clears throat> um, the orbit space M mod G is rarely a manifold. It will be if the action is free, but that's rarely the case. <coughs> so the goal therefore is, since it will have singularities in general, the goal is perhaps one can nicely stratify the space to fit into our picture of stratified spaces. So the goal is um, stratify the orbit space. So again, I will be a little bit sketchy here, of course. This requires some serious arguments from differential topology, which, which I cannot obviously give here. But I want to at least describe how you can get the pure strata, okay? We will describe. how to obtain a pure strata for a stratification. So remember, pure strata will be these differences. Or, well, perhaps connected components thereof. Or, I mean, I, I will not be very precise about that. Okay. Uh, so what do you do? Um, we have to talk about orbit types. Now the pure strata are the differences. Yes, right, right, right. So I want to describe the differences. It's more natural in this context to directly describe the differences, yeah. yeah. Um, so <clears throat> uh, let H be a closed subgroup. Then I define a set, first it's just a set, subset of M. Uh, these are, are all points X in M uh, such that, okay, some notation. So I'll write G sub X for what's called the isotropy group at the point X. So this is a subgroup of G consisting of all the elements that fix X, right? All G such that GX equals X. That's called the isotropy group or stabilizer group and, and so on. So I'll denote that uh, with this symbol. And um, I want to collect all those points whose isotropy subgroup is conjugate to H. So this symbol means conjugate. Um, so then you have to convince yourself that this is a, an, an embedded submanifold, embedded smooth submanifold, uh, of M. Also notice that this is a union of orbits because If you move a point by a group element and compute the stabilizer there, it's obviously just G, GX, G inverse. And so this is conjugate to GX. 
So if you move a point to some different point via the group action, uh, the isotropy groups are conjugate to each other. And so therefore, in particular, this means that if a point is in that set, then the entire orbit is also in that set. And therefore, the set can be envisioned as a union of orbits. Right? <clears throat> All right. Uh, now, uh, there is the, f so let's assume, actually, let's assume here perhaps that um, the orbit space is connected. So then there's the following fact. There exists uh, a, a unique uh, orbit type. Uh, I'm going to call it H0 such that the corresponding M uh, is open and dense. And this orbit type is called the principal orbit type. <coughs> now for simplicity, I mean, I don't want to work with a lot of notation here and so on, so I want to make things as simple as possible. So for, uh, as for simplicity, assume here that, so I want to make two assumptions about the group action. The principal orbit type is just uh, the one given by the identity element. E here is the identity element in the group. And furthermore, uh, there are only two orbit types. Well, one is E, the principal orbit type, and then there is one other orbit type which is responsible for making the quotient, the orbit space, singular. Because if this were the only orbit type, then the action would be free on the entire manifold. And in this case, the quotient would be a manifold and the discussion wouldn't be interesting. So let's assume that the minimal situation where singularities can occur, which is in addition to this E, there is also a second orbit type. Let's call it H. So. <clears throat> Um, so essentially what you do is you look at ME and you look at the orbit space of that piece and then you have the orbit projection. And then this is in fact a fiber bundle. Because here the action is free. So the fibers of the map are of course the orbits, but the orbits look like G because the action is free over that orbit type. But then there's the other one, namely MH. Um, similarly here you have the orbit projection but this time the it's still a fiber bundle a smooth fiber bundle uh, and um, but the fiber is uh, homeomorphic to G mod H right? because that is the 
the orbit type, the isotropy type uh, over that piece. Um, so we have these fiber bundles. And these can be given the structure of a smooth manifold. So these base spaces are smooth manifolds. And the entire manifold M itself is decomposed into this disjoint union, this piece. And so the orbit space is decomposed. So the orbit space M mod G is decomposed as this piece union this piece. So these you can take as your open strata. For the orbit space. Uh, and then uh, later in the summer school, uh, we will talk about Whitney stratified spaces. And it can, in fact, be shown that this le leads to a Whitney, so-called Whitney stratification. Um, this will yield what's called a Whitney stratification. Um, so I, this I cannot show here. Uh, so. But once you know this, then one can furthermore show, and perhaps we'll see some aspects of this, that in a Whitney stratification, one has this uh, local normal triviality condition. That's a, that's a very non-trivial fact, of course, but it can be shown, it is true. And once you know this, you will then know that this in fact gives you uh, a topologically stratified space in particular. But there are some difficult steps that I'm sort of skipping here. But it does give a topologically stratified space in the sense of our, of our definition. So you get a topological, topological stratification of the orbit space that way. Now, in fact, in the, in the problem session, I want to take this up again and discuss it a little bit further. Namely, if the claim is that this is a topologically stratified space and, and therefore we are expected to believe that the normal uh, triviality condition holds, then there must be a link, of course, right? So how can you actually describe the link? in such a situation. And I would like to discuss this a little bit in the problem session. <clears throat> and we'll just make life even easier. So I'll even add to the assumption that we've had here I mean, of course, if this assumption is not true, if there are, say, k orbit types, then, of course, you get, you get corresponding to each orbit type. You get a piece and so on, right? You can, you can imagine how it goes. Uh, but in the problem session, let's simplify further and say, assume uh, that G acts transitively So number four, uh, <coughs> real algebraic varieties 
one could discuss complex, of course, also in a similar manner. But let me here uh, maybe focus on real algebraic varieties. So let's say in Rn we are given a variety cut out by a number of polynomials, say f1 through fk. So f1 through fk, these are real polynomials. And what this notation means is you look at the set of points uh, that are common zeros for all of these k polynomials. Now the question is, is this, can this be endowed in a fairly natural manner with a stratification as we required it here or not, right? Or how would you do that? Yes? Yeah, just one simple point. I mean, the, strat the filtration is not the stratification. I mean, the, I mean, well, I call it the stratification here the in my... The strata are the differences. Yeah? Um, well, yeah, in the literature, both terminology, both terms exist. Clo sometimes people say closed strata and open strata or pure strata. So um, when one discusses Whitney stratifications and decompositions into what's sometimes called these pieces, these would correspond to the pure strata, right, or the open strata. But sometimes people use the, the term closed strata for, for these kinds of unions also. Yeah, but we could Yeah, I mean, for what I'm going to do, I need both terms. So maybe I'll try to say open strata and closed strata. So then it's always clear which one I mean. Yeah, so, yeah okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so um, are, are there other questions, by the way, uh, in, in, in the meantime? So please don't hesitate to ask if, if something is unclear that's on the board or... Uh, <clears throat> Well, so um, what I want to indicate here, this is a complicated story in general, by the way, to think this through completely. So, but let's discuss some aspects of it. So um, this goes back to Whitney. And uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit his paper, uh, Elementary Structure. Uh, of real algebraic varieties from uh, 57. <clears throat> well, what he does in this paper is the following. So uh, maybe it's good to recall from algebraic geometry some notions which you may, I mean, maybe most of you are familiar with it, but I, I thought I'd recall it anyway. Uh, so. Suppose P is a point in this variety. You can look at the Jacobian matrix at P. So this is a K by N matrix. And you can look at the rank of this matrix. Let's call this the rank of X at the point P. Now then you take the maximum and let's call this the rank of X. The rank of the variety is the maximum over all points of these ranks at these points. And now recall the following definition. Recall P is called singular, a singular point P is a singular point of X if the rank at that particular point is strictly less than the rank of the variety. And uh, otherwise, let's call the point regular or non-singular. And so P is non-singular or regular uh, otherwise. So if if the rank at that point actually is the maximum 
of all these, of all these ranks. So this classification of points uh, decomposes the given variety into two sets of points, the singular points and the regular ones. So we obtain <coughs> So this leads to a singular set in X and a set of regular points, which maybe I'll write like this in X. <coughs> and X is the disjoint union, obviously, of, of, of these two. Um, now, what can we say about these sets? So about this set, we can say the following. So the set of regular points is a manifold is a manifold of dimension uh, n minus rank x. Right, so this is a manifold piece. Now the singular set need not, of course, be a manifold. It could be, it need not be. But one thing that's important here is you can actually apply this procedure inductively because the singular set is again algebraic. It is an algebraic variety. So that's one thing that we note about the singular set. It is an algebraic variety. Um, <coughs> namely, look at the fi together with all determinants uh, of submatrices of size rank x cross rank X of the Jacobian, sub-matrices sub of the Jacobian, right? So if all of these vanish, uh, then the point, that's precisely the case when the point is singular. And determinants are just polynomials, of course. Uh, so, um, so we have an algebraic condition that cuts out the singular set in its own right. Therefore, Whitney says, so this, these are all things that Whitney observes, right? He shows this, he shows this, uh, and then he observes, therefore, we can apply this inductively. And um, so, so inductively, get, we get a filtration starting with x, and then you look at the singular set, <coughs> a closed subset in x. But then since this is a singular variety, you can take the singular points of the singular points and get a subset in there, and so on. And uh, after finitely many uh, uh, steps, this stops, and you get a filtration by closed subsets such that by this remark, the differences are all manifolds. So you have a very beautiful and very natural decomposition of an algebraic variety into manifolds, which is part of what we wanted for a stratification, right? So, um, so this is a manifold and this difference is a manifold, and so on. So Whitney calls this uh, a manifold collection. Whitney speaks of a manifold collection.
Now for the problem session, I would like you to think about the following. Is this a stratification? Is this a topologically stratified space with this filtration? <coughs> I mean, I've already done step one. The question is, for what Whitney does, is the local normal triviality condition satisfied or not? In other words, so I would like you to think about um, uh, do this for the so-called Whitney umbrella, which is, of course, the picture on the poster for the summer school. So we should discuss the Whitney umbrella a little bit. And so do this for the Whitney umbrella. And this is the variety given by x squared minus zy squared equals 0 in R3. So you should simply carry out the algorithm that I've described here explicitly. I've given you an explicit algorithm for computing this. So you get, these, you get this filtration. You should compute it for the Whitney umbrella. And then you should see whether you believe topologically that this condition is satisfied by this decomposition or not. So this is one thing that we should discuss in the, in the problem session. <coughs> okay. So that's all I'm going to say so far about algebraic varieties. Uh, and we continue that discussion in the problem session. Okay, this is... Not finished in a way, but I want to continue it in the problem session. I want to move on to another class, uh, an important class uh, of uh, stratifiable spaces, namely uh, a very large area of mathematics, the area of transformation groups. So, my, so I want to discuss here um, transformation groups. and make some remarks about ways in which to get a stratification for the orbit space of such an action. So um, let G be a compact Lie group uh, acting smoothly on a closed smooth manifold. on MH well under this assumption what is this piece can somebody see this does everybody know what when an action is transitive is, is that not well known? So an action is transitive if you can move any point to any other point by an application of a group element. So then what is this quotient? If I, if I can move any point in here to any other point, Well, it's a space. It's not, this does not have the structure of a group, right? This is just a manifold. There is no, the orbit space does not have the structure of a group. A point. point, yes, yes. It's, it's obviously just a point, right? If the, the space of, or, if there's only one orbit, then the space of orbits is a point, right? So, so. so in other words, I'm saying assume that this piece is a point. So maybe I should note this here. <laughs> so this is just another way of assuming that, that this is a point. 
So in other words, I just want to at least understand the simple situation when there is one isolated singularity. Right? So this is a situation where you have one isolated. So in other words, we say that m mod g has one isolated singular point. And so what I would like you to think about for the problem session uh, perhaps is um, uh, use, I'll give you even a hint, use the slice theorem, use the well-known slice theorem in transformation groups um, to describe the link L Of, of that point, of that one singular point. So um, if you don't know what the slice theorem is, you should look into, for example, I mean, it's a standard theorem in transformation groups. You could, for example, look into Bredon's book on transformation groups. It's described very well there. So I'd, I'd like you to do that, okay? Uh, Sorry? Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Of course one should mention, one, one should perhaps also mention here the book by Markus Pflaum, Uh, who is doing an excellent job of explaining all of this, right? How, how to get these stratifications. So, so I also urge you to take a look at Markus' book for some of the foundational aspects of stratification theory from a geometrical uh, uh, point of view. Um, okay, good. Now in the remaining 10 minutes, So I think now we have seen lots of examples of stratified spaces. We've seen that lots of spaces that come up in nature, large classes of spaces that do have singularities that are not manifolds, do however fit into the framework that we described. Right? And so now I think it's justified to try to develop uh, a theory, algebraic invariants, etc for such spaces, right? Which will then be applicable to all the examples that we gave. I mean, you can then use intersection homology or L2 cohomology to study orbit spaces. You can use it to study algebraic varieties, etc., etc., as we have now seen. Right? So <clears throat> I, I want to return to considerations of Poincaré duality. Perhaps before I do, one last thing about uh, stratification theory from these points of views. The definition that I gave of a topological stratified uh, space can be phrased in much the same way for PL spaces to obtain what's called a PL stratified space. So, I won't write all of this down anymore, but you change the obvious things. So you would say a PL stratified space is a PL space in the sense as I have defined it, is a PL space together with a uh, filtration by subcomplexes, by sub PL spaces closed, such that the differences are PL manifolds and um, such that the normal triviality condition holds in the piecewise linear sense. In other words, the link should now again, of course, be a PL stratified space and the homeomorphism should in fact be a PL homeomorphism preserving the strata. So then you automatically have a notion of PL stratified space. Um. <clears throat> now to return to Poincaré duality, in fact, for Poincaré duality to make sense, 
we need to assume a little bit more about the space in addition to the structure we've described so far. Namely, <coughs> let's, let's study an example here for a second. Suppose, suppose I have a manifold. M is some manifold. And in there, you have some submanifold. Uh, let me just call it A, some submanifold. And um, this has some dimension n. And now you take another submanifold of some dimension m, where n is not m. Uh, such that so this should also be a, this should be a compact manifold, and I want the boundary of this manifold to be A. Then I can form a space X by attaching these two along A, and it's a stratified space, right? It's a stratified space in the sense but it does not possibly make any sense to try to consider Poincaré duality for such a space. Because remember, as I be explained in the very beginning of this lecture, uh, there is always a dimension which is crucial for Poincaré duality. It's always, uh, you, 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 comparing, you compare groups in complementary dimensions. So now for this space, which dimension should you take as the Poincaré duality dimension? Should you take n? Should you take m? It obviously makes no sense, right? I mean, there, there are no duality partners. Whichever you take, n or m, uh, something will go wrong. And there's no geometrically meaningful way to try to get Poincaré duality for such a space. So for example, right, you have something higher dimensional and you attach something like this of, of lower dimension, right? That's, that's sort of the picture. Poincaré duality cannot make any sense because you have, you have classes in here that are of lower dimension. How should they pair with respect, say, to the larger dimension in that space and so on? It cannot be done, of course. Therefore, from considering such examples, we see it's necessary to adopt further conditions on a stratified space so as to uh, have a chance to have Poincaré duality. Right. And that's what we'll do next. So I say to exclude things like this, I define what a pseudo-manifold is. So definition. Uh, <coughs> a topological stratified pseudo-manifold of dimension n is, of course, a topological stratified space x of dimension n uh, such that now two more conditions are satisfied. Namely, firstly, To exclude things like this, I would like, well, maybe I should first say, first let's assume that xn minus 1 is equal to xn minus 2, i.e. I want to assume that the singular set starts in co-dimension 2 and there are no singularities of co-dimension 1. This is to exclude sort of, if you will, boundary type phenomena. Um, so that I don't have to somehow attempt to phrase a Lefschetz type duality for intersection homology, which can be done, but um, at first stage, I think it's better to explain without boundary type phenomena what the duality is. For the, This is the analog of a closed manifold, if you will, uh, <coughs> in the world of singular spaces. So I want that. And then secondly, I want this space, which is the first difference, because this is now x minus xn minus 1. 
I want this to be open and dense. I mean, it is open, that's not a condition, but I want it to be dense in X. And so, for example, this is not true here for two reasons, right? <laughs> Neither of these are sat sat satisfied in this example. If this is literally S2, if it's S3, um, then uh, this condition is okay, but this one is still not okay because there are points out here that are not limits of points in the top stratum, which are the points here on that sphere. So uh, these examples then are excluded by these conditions. And for the, as we shall then see uh, next time, we will have a chance, uh, and, and in fact we will do it, we will, def we will uh, see how to get Poincaré duality for such um, pseudo-manifolds. By the way, this um, notion of pseudo-manifold comes from PL topology. And if in fact you have a PL space, you can also say it differently. You can say it directly. If you have fixed the triangulation, you can directly express this, uh, this condition by saying that every simplex should be the face of some n simplex. So there's a dimension n associated to it again, which will be the Poincaré duality dimension. And um, I should say that every n minus 1 simplex is the face of precisely two n simplices and every, uh, and every simplex is the face of some n simplex. And this is exactly equivalent uh, to saying this, right, for a PL space. And that's where this actually comes from, this notion of this is sort of a topological version of what I just said with simplices. Okay, so I'll conclude today's lecture with these uh, remarks. Thank you. <coughs> are there are there any questions? Uh, yes. Are the examples you gave of stratified spaces also stratified pseudo manifolds? Um, well, uh, so let's see. Um, witness stratified spaces can be triangulated, indeed, but that's a theorem, right? That's not so obvious. Uh, it is, of course, perhaps well known that smooth manifolds can always be triangulated. And in fact, this is also true for witness stratified spaces. And therefore, these spaces, when, when you start with a smooth action, are then, in fact, uh, PL spaces. Now, of course, if you study topological group actions, the situation becomes much more complicated. This I did not discuss. But orbit spaces of topological actions can look very wild. And um, it's not an easy matter to have a stratification theory for such objects. Uh, Frank Quinn has, in fact, done this. He has a notion of um, what's called homotopically stratified spaces, where links are uh, replaced by homotopy links and, and path spaces and so on. And, and then you can stratify those. But those certainly then need not be PL, of course. But, it, but it, in the context we discussed here, those, uh, those are PL. Of course, these simple examples, that's all PL. I mean, that was so explicit, circle and tori and so on, cones. I mean, that's clearly PL. And, um, and algebraic varieties, as I explained, can be Whitney stratified. And therefore, by what I said earlier, they are also PL in particular, yes. No, 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 but this is a counterexample. I, I can do this PL, so right? The question is, are examples pseudo manifolds? Not that uh, I don't care about the answer to the PL part. Yeah. So, uh, say the question again. Uh, what? Do you have examples of stratified spaces? And topologically stratified. Topologically yeah. stratified spaces, and afterwards you defined what are topologically stratified pseudo manifolds. Yes. No, 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 uh, that, that, no, obviously that need not be the case. For example, if you uh, take S1 acting on 
the two sphere by, <coughs> you know, by uh, rotations like this, then the orbit space is just an interval. And that's not a pseudo manifold because it has a boundary. So in general, this, there are, for group actions, you have to adopt further conditions to ensure that it is in fact even, as, even a, um, a pseudo manifold. That's why I actually, in my lecture, separated out these two conditions and first only talked about topological spaces because then this is certainly true, but the pseudo manifold condition, one would has, have to, uh, as I say, adopt more conditions on the action to ensure that such phenomena cannot occur. All right, uh, other questions? Okay, so thanks again. <laughs>